Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today uh, for our East, uh, third ECGI Spotlight session. Um, today, we will have Professor um, Nadia Malenko, an associate professor from the University of Michigan, uh, present uh, her paper um, entitled Trading and Shareholder Democracy. Um, Nadia Malenko is an associate professor at the University of Michigan. She is also an associate uh, editor at several leading uh, finance journals, including the Journal of Finance, the Review of Financial Studies, the Journal of Corporate Finance. And she's also a delightful and deep academic, and I hope you will all enjoy uh, today's meeting. And Nadia, I'm passing the virtual microphone to you. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to present in your Spotlight series. This is joint work with Daron Levit and Ernst Mauck, and we very much look forward to all your feedback and comments. So let me start with the motivation for this paper. Over the last decades, we have observed a secular shift from board primacy to shareholder democracy in many advanced economies. And in particular, regulations and charter amendments have enhanced shareholders' voting rights. Shareholders now vote not only in director elections and auditors, corporate transactions, but they also vote on various corporate governance issues, executive compensation, and social and environmental policies. And very often this shift of power from boards to shareholder voting uh, takes for granted that shareholder voting increases welfare by giving power to the people, by giving power to those who own the shares, a form of corporate democracy. However, what we want to point out is that unlike the political setting, a key feature of the corporate setting is the existence of the markets for firms' shares. And in particular, Markets allow investors to choose their ownership stakes in companies based on their preferences and based on the stock price. So since voting rights can be sold and bought, the shareholder base and hence the voter base uh, becomes endogenous. This interaction between trading and voting results in an important feedback loop. On the one hand, expected voting outcomes affect shareholders' valuations of the shares and this determines shareholders' trading decisions. But then trading decisions in turn determine the composition of the shareholder base, and the composition of the shareholder base determines who gets to vote, and hence the voting outcomes themselves. So understanding this interaction between trading and voting has become especially important given other recent trends, such as the growth in index funds. These funds vote but don't actively trade and the rise in the environmental and social issues. These issues affect investors' utility and hence their voting decisions beyond their impact on their ownership stakes determined by trading. So the goal of this paper is to develop a theoretical framework to analyze the link between trading and shareholder voting. And as we show, it has important implications for prices, shareholder welfare, and this choice between shareholder voting and decision-making by the board. So let me talk uh, about uh, a few uh, related strands of the literature. There is a very large literature, theoretical and empirical, on shareholder voting. And uh, our contribution to this literature is to focus on the trading voting feedback loop uh, and to emphasize that the shareholder base that gets to vote uh, on issues is endogenous. Uh, there is a related literature on vote trading, which studies what happens when shareholders can trade voting rights separately from cash flow rights. And our paper is complementary to this literature because we focus on uh, situations when voting and cash flow rights are bundled together and traded together, which is an important feature of most publicly traded stocks. Finally, there is a large literature on the allocation of control between shareholders and management. And we contribute to this literature by emphasizing the role of trading in this choice between board primacy and shareholder democracy. So let me now provide the, an, uh, our theoretical framework uh, in a nutshell. Uh, we consider a setting where shareholders trade and then vote on a proposal. And you can think of uh, proposals like mergers and acquisitions, proxified, or uh, ESG issues. Uh, first, uh, shareholders trade in a competitive market uh, they face certain frictions, such as 
liquidity, illiquidity, wealth constraints, or portfolio considerations. And liquidity will matter because it will determine to what extent trading can shift the shareholder base. After trading, shareholders receive some news about the proposal, about how much value it creates for the company. Uh, you can think of disclosure by management or of proxy advisors' recommendations as, as providing this information. And then after observing this information, shareholders vote whatever shares they own after trading, and the proposal is approved if it gets high enough voting support. For example, 50% after simple major under simple majority rule. An important feature of uh, our framework is that shareholders have heterogeneous preferences regarding the proposal. And let me provide a motivation for this, for this feature. So it has been pointed out repeatedly that shareholders are heterogeneous. For example, Martin and Parknoy note that it is simply not true that the preferences of shareholders are likely to be similar. Hayden and Bodhi provide an overview of different sources of shareholder heterogeneity and note that there are many ways in which shareholders fail to share common interests and that they may have very different notions of what wealth maximization means. And consistent with this view, uh, there are many uh, papers that have pointed out heterogeneity across uh, shareholders, which is often manifested in the way shareholders vote. Uh, for example, Two recent uh, papers uh, have classified different mutual funds according to their corporate governance philosophy, as well as social ideology, and point out that uh, these differences affect, uh, to a large extent, how shareholders vote. There are also differences in time horizon, short-term versus long-term shareholders, and many other important dimensions. Uh, finally, a broader interpretation of this uh, heterogeneity, heterogeneity of preferences could be differences of opinion about firms' policies. So this heterogeneity affects how shareholders vote on proposals. In particular, uh, remember shareholders received news about the proposal. And let's uh, think about this news den as denoted by Q. Suppose that High Q stands for good news, meaning that the proposal is beneficial for firm value, and low Q means bad news about the value of the proposal. Certain shareholders, which we refer to as more activist shareholders, they have preferences in favor of the proposal. They like it. And that means they require relatively little evidence to vote for the proposal. So when they see the information, they apply a relatively low cutoff and vote uh, in favor sufficiently often. On the other hand, there is also another category of shareholders who we refer to as conservative shareholders because they like the status quo. They don't like the proposal. And such shareholders require a lot of evidence uh, to be convinced to vote in its favor. So these shareholders will apply a high uh, cutoff uh, on this news about the proposal. Uh, now let's uh, think how these different preferences regarding the shareholder uh, value from the proposal affect their trading decisions. So when shareholders trade the firm's shares, they anticipate that the proposal will be approved if the news about its value is sufficiently positive, uh, above a certain cutoff, call it Q star. Uh, there will be two important scenarios which will differ. The first scenario is when this cutoff is small, which means shareholders require relatively little evidence to be convinced that the proposal is value improving and will uh, vote in its favor uh, quite often. So the proposal is likely to be approved. In this situation, if we think about shareholders' relations of the firm's shares, it will be these activist shareholders who like the proposal, who, like, who will value the firm more because they expect their preferred outcome to be chosen with a high probability. And these heterogeneous relations create gains from trade. When shareholders trade, conservative shareholders who value the firm less will sell their shares to the activist shareholders who value the firm more. Essentially what we should observe is matching between firms and owners Shareholders who like the expected outcome will end up owning the firm. And um, there will be an important uh, shareholder who will refer to as the marginal trader. 
that would be the investor who is just indifferent between buying and selling shares at the market clearing price. And that investor will be determined by uh, the uh, market clearing, that the demand and supply for the shares are the same. The valuation of this marginal trader determines the stock price in the market. So this is the first scenario when the proposal is likely to be approved. An alternative scenario is when this cutoff on the value of, the, of on, the, on the information on the news is sufficiently high. And that means shareholders require a lot of evidence uh, in favor uh, of the proposal and the proposal is likely to be rejected. In this case, we see the opposite pattern. Now it's the conservative shareholders who prefer the status quo and dislike the proposal, who value the firm the most, again, because their preferred outcome is likely to be chosen. So now activists will sell their shares to conservatives and the firm will be owned by more conservative shareholders. So we again observe this matching between firms and shareholders and the price will be determined by the marginal trader. Uh, now that we understand uh, these trading decisions, what is important to point out is that the trading will affect what will happen at the voting when shareholders get to vote on the proposal. Uh, the post-trade shareholder base will determine the voting outcome. For example, suppose uh, we consider this first scenario in the activist equilibrium where the proposal is likely to be approved and in which activists get to own the firm's shares after trading. These shareholders, this green right, uh, area, those would be the shareholders who will get to vote for the proposal. Uh, and in particular, there'll be an important shareholder among these post-trade shareholders who will refer to as the median voter. This is the shareholder whose vote essentially coincides and determines the voting outcome. So think of a simple majority rule. The median voter will be the shareholder with median preferences among these post-trade uh, activist shareholders. If this median voter votes in favor of the proposal, then everyone who is more activist, who is more inclined towards the proposal than him will also vote in favor. So the proposal will be approved given the simple majority rule. And if the median voter votes against the proposal, everyone who is more conservative than him will vote against the proposal. So the identity of the median voter will be crucial for what uh, a decision on the proposal will be made. And similarly, in the conservative equilibrium, where it's the conservatives who uh, end up owning the firm's shares, the median voter will be among these more conservative shareholders. So now that we understand this, how trading and voting works, let me start talking about the implications. So our first implication is non-fundamental indeterminacy of uh, voting outcomes. And in particular, what we show is that the activist and conservative equilibria can coexist. And the reason they can coexist is because voting outcomes, expectations about voting outcomes become self-fulfilling due to trading. Uh, to see this, consider, for example, the first scenario. Uh, suppose shareholders expect that the proposal will be accepted. As we discussed in this case, activists value the firm more than conservatives because their preferred outcome is expected to be implemented. So they will buy shares from conservatives. And then these activists, shareholders who buy shares will get to vote on the proposal. So the post-trade shareholder base, the voter base will be activist and since these shareholders like the proposal, they will end up indeed approving the proposal sufficiently, often confirming these exante expectations. Likewise, if shareholders expect the proposal to be rejected, conservatives value the firm more, they buy shares from activists, end up owning the firm, and then at the voting stage, they end up rejecting the proposal since they are biased as the status quo, again, confirming the exante expectations. Um, and this property, the self-fulfilling expectations is quite consistent with a recent paper by Cox, Mandina and Thomas who show large ownership changes in m and targets after the deal announcement. And moreover, they show that subsequent likelihood that the deal is approved is related to these ownership changes. 
So the self-fulfilling nature, this non-fundamental uh, indeterminacy presents a potential empirical challenge to studying shareholder voting, because it means that firms with similar fundamental characteristics may end up having very different ownership structures and moving in different strategic directions because they will have different voting outcomes. In the paper we discuss in what context uh, these non-fundamental indeterminacy is, like, is more likely. And it's more likely when trading allows for larger swings in the shareholder base. That would be the case if the start firm's shares are more liquid, if the firm doesn't have a lot of long-term non-transient shareholders such as index funds. Index funds alleviate this non-fundamental indeterminacy. And this indeterminacy is more likely for proposal with substantial preference heterogeneity across shareholders, such as environmental and social proposals. Our second implication relates to the uh, prices and shareholder welfare. And in particular, we show that prices and shareholder welfare can move in opposite directions, which potentially casts doubt on the validity uh, of this common interpretation of event studies of shareholder voting. So to understand this implication, let me describe pri how prices and shareholder welfare are determined. So the stock price, if you remember, is the relation of the marginal trader. This is the shareholder who is just indifferent between buying and selling shares. So he's the most conservative among uh, shareholders who end up owning the firm in, this, uh, in, in, the, in the activistic group. Uh, what is shareholder welfare? We define shareholder welfare as the relation of the initial shareholder base. So the average relation among all of those shareholders who initially own the firm, both conservatives and actives. However, as we show this, relation of the initial shareholder base equals uh, the relation of the average shareholder post trade, this relation of the average post trade shareholder. And the reason is buyers, activists, compensate sellers, conservatives, through the price. And this gains and losses from trading in financial markets they cancel out. So shareholder welfare essentially uh, is determined by the post trade shareholder base relation. So the price is the relation of the marginal trader. Shareholder welfare is the relation of the average shareholder who holds the shares after trading. But what is important, both of uh, these relations are determined by the ultimate decision rule that the firm will apply when uh, the decision on the proposal is made. And thus they are determined by, the, by who the median voter is. Both the marginal trader and the average shareholder, they value the firm more, is the decision rule is as close as possible to their pre own preferences, which means they would like the median voter to be closer to them. So now we can understand why prices and welfare can move in opposite direction in response to corporate governance shocks. So let's take right, this the marginal trader and average post-trade shareholder and consider a shock, for example, to the firm's majority requirement. So suppose we decrease the we increase the majority requirement. What this shock to the corporate governance structure means is that the median voter will become more conservative, because now with a high majority requirement, more and more evidence uh, is required to convince um, shareholders to vote in its favor. So the median voter is uh, becomes more conservative, meaning he moves closer to the marginal trader and farther away from the average post-trade shareholder. And this means the shareholders, the marginal traders valuation is now closer aligned with the median voter. So the price increases, but the post-trade shareholder uh, is farther away from the median voter. His preferences are now further away from the outcome that the firm will uh, be implementing and this decreases shareholder wealth. Uh, in the paper, we also show that price and welfare reactions to voting outcomes themselves can have opposite signs, and that limits the interpretation of event studies of shareholder voting, which focus on price reactions to voting outcomes. So given that uh, this price uh, welfare discrepancy 
is important for our interpretation of empirical studies, uh, we discuss in what circumstances this discrepancy between prices and welfare will be highest. Uh, first of all, this discrepancy will be highest when the post-trade shareholder base is more heterogeneous, because in this case, it's more likely than the marginal trader who determines the price is farther away from the average post-trade shareholder whose valuation determines welfare. This heterogeneity of the post-trade shareholder base is more likely with less liquid uh, markets. And when there are stronger disagreements among shareholders uh, about the proposal. So that would be more likely for environmental and social issues uh, compared, for example, to issues where there is a clear conflict between managers on the one hand and all shareholders on the other. In addition, uh, this discrepancy is more likely when the outcome of the vote is close. So think of clo being close to the 50% margin. And the reason is if there is overwhelming support for the proposal, it's quite likely that both the marginal trader and the average post-trade shareholder voted in favor of the proposal meaning that the proposal was beneficial for both of them. When the vote out is, outcome is close, it's more likely there were disagreements between the two and prices and welfare were affected in different directions. Another implication I would like to, to talk about is about the implications of trading. Uh, we show that trade can be harmful for prices and welfare. Greater opportunities to trade, higher stock liquidity, may be detrimental. And the intuition is that as we relax trading frictions, this allows for more extreme swings in the shareholder base. So the post-trade shareholder base becomes more extreme, think of more activist in the activist equilibrium, and in particular, the median voter becomes more extreme as well. These higher, more extreme preferences of the median voter can widen the gap between the median voter and the average shareholder and decrease welfare. So put simply, trade allows shareholders with more extreme preferences to accumulate large positions and use their voting power to implement this, their preferred policies. So this highlights this important uh, real effect uh, of financial markets through the voting channel. Uh, given that trading can allow extreme voters to uh, implement their preferred agendas, a natural question to ask is, can shareholders benefit from delegating decisions to the board of directors instead of voting? And that's what we explore next. We show that the board that maximizes shareholder welfare is biased. It caters to the more extreme shareholders, but nevertheless, this biased board is preferred to shareholder voting. However, we also show that because of trading, uh, this optimal, optimal board may not be electable. So let me describe why uh, we uh, come to these conclusions. So if decisions are made by the board, shareholders still trade anticipating, trying to anticipate what policies will be chosen and adjusting to uh, their uh, so th there will be this adjustment of the shareholder base to the voting outcome, but they won't vote. It will be the board that will unilaterally decide on the proposal. So first, let's try to understand which board is optimal, which board maximizes the welfare of the initial shareholders. Uh, to understand this, remember that the, the board, the initial shareholder welfare equals the relation of the average post-trade shareholder, okay, because uh, buyers compensate uh, sellers through, through prices they pay. In other words, if we look at our shareholder base and the post-trade shareholder base, the optimal board should cater to the post-trade shareholders, to this average shareholder who holds shares after trading. That would be the optimal board. Uh, is this optimal board unbiased? It is not. An unbiased board is the board that maximizes the preferences that, that, that uh, captures the bias of the average shareholder base prior to trading. You can see, right, that includes it's both conservatives and activists. So the optimal board is not an unbiased board. In other words, with trade, the optimal board is always biased. And the reason 
is that even though it caters to the post-trade shareholder base, this also benefits the moderate shareholders who sell their shares because they can now sell for a higher price. The shareholders who buy from them are willing to pay a higher price knowing that the board will cater to their preferences. So the optimal board is biased. However, being optimal, it is preferred to shareholder voting. And that means that the simple intuition that whenever the board is biased, shareholder democracy dominates board primacy is not necessarily correct when we take into account trade. Finally, we ask, well, if shareholders can choose to delegate decision-making to this optimal board, will they choose to do so? And here trading again uh, interferes with um, the simple logic that decisions should be delegated to the optimal board. So suppose that prior to um, uh, that the shareholders can make the decision, can vote on whether to delegate their decision uh, making to the board. What we show that shareholders can vote against delegation to the optimal board. The reason are short term trading considerations that shareholders take into account. Because shareholders who expect to buy, they would like to buy at the lowest possible prices. And these short term trading considerations, the desire to buy at lower prices may lead them to implement value reducing policies, stock price reducing policies, and in particular, vote against value maximizing delegation. Uh, our framework allows to analyze other important issues such as index fund ownership, uh, the, the importance of social concerns about environmental and social issues. And we're also working on a follow up paper where we study the role of block holders and examine the implications for the voting premium on the firm's shares. But let me now return to the main question that I asked at the beginning. Should decision making be delegated to the board or should shareholders get to vote? And what we want to emphasize in this paper is that when we think about this debate, it's very crucial to account for trading by shareholders for several reasons. Trading, as we, as we discussed, allows extreme investors to accumulate voting power. And these ability to accumulate voting power through financial markets may hurt moderate shareholders and decrease shareholder welfare. When shareholders can trade, the simple intuition that a biased board is always dominated by shareholder voting may not be true because the board, optimal board actually is biased and caters to the more uh, extreme shareholders. And finally, short term trading considerations may prevent shareholders from optimally delegating to the board. So this is uh, the main conclusion that trading affects the choice between shareholder democracy and board primacy. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia, for an excellent presentation. So now we move on to our panelists. We have three panelists. We have Amil Dasgupta from the LSE. We have Robert Schuchner from Savion Capital. And we have Denis Grom from HSC Paris. We start and after, uh, and for the participants, if you like to pose questions, please use the Q&A function. And then Miriam and or I will then bring them up uh, after we had uh, uh, the of the panelists have been given their views and raised their questions. Okay, Amir, why don't you start? Great, thank you very much, uh, uh, um, Mike. Um, can you all see my slides? Okay. Yes. Excellent. Um, thanks very much. So uh, thank you for inviting me to, to discuss this. I have to tell you that when one of uh, your co-authors, in this case, uh, Mike Borkhardt, bids you to discuss the paper of another of your co-authors, in this case, Ernst Mark, um, it places you in what we in England would call a sticky wicket. Do, do I say uh, no and annoy Mike, or do I say yes and risk annoying Ernst Mark? Um, in any case, faced with this impossible situation, I did say yes, and I'm very glad I did because it's a lovely paper. It was a really uh, a great opportunity to get to um, read it. And um, I enjoyed all aspects of it. So I have nothing negative to, to say at all. So, um, so um, let me, uh, I think Nadia did a wonderful job on, on outlining the, um, the uh, uh, 
message of the paper. Um, so let me just uh, summarize very briefly that if you think about shareholder democracy and political democracy, there's this key difference that in shareholder democracy, voters trade and this trading affects the voter base uh, through uh, uh, the endogenous process of reallocation of, of, of shares. And this difference really matters in a model with heterogeneous preferences. That's sort of the broad uh, message of the paper. In terms of the actual outputs of the paper, I think there are both interesting findings and normative implications. I'm ha happy to say my categorization of the interesting findings follows almost exactly what, what, uh, how Nadia presented them. So I'll be brief on the findings and, and more perhaps on, uh, speak more on my uh, in interpretation of the normative implications. Um, which of course are idiosyncratic to me. Um, so I'll let Nadia have the last word on, on whether this is right or not. So the first uh, 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 fascinating finding from the paper is that similar firms, similar in terms of fundamentals can follow very different paths because of the self-fulfilling congregation through trade of like-minded shareholders, okay? Um, so as a result, uh, an implication of this uh, for, would be that since similar firms, since firm fundamentals are quite tenuously linked to outcomes, I think empirical research and corporate governance has to be particularly careful. Um, and, and, and I think this is a, a finding that, that we can all uh, buy. Um, the second is I think that the, the heart of the paper, the heart of how the paper works in some sense, which is that this endogenous trading and voting can drive a difference between the marginal voter um, and the average post-trade shareholder. This, Nadia explained this extremely well. And essentially, whenever the marginal voter is more extreme in their views than the average post-trade shareholder, then two sets of problems, quote unquote, can, can arise. One is that shareholder welfare can move differently in a different direction to, to prices. So it's, it can be very tenuously linked, the idea of welfare and prices. Um, which of course means that it's uh, really hard to use prices and empirical analysis of, of these questions. Maybe the normative implication for the profession would be that we should stop writing empirical papers as a theorist. I'm okay with that, but I'll let Nadia uh, have the final word on that. Um, the, the, the second is that because additional liquidity as they define it, sort of the ability to trade uh, more, uh, leads to more extreme characterizations of the, the shareholder base. So in some sense, it can exacerbate these differences between the marginal voter and the average post-trade shareholders and can actually worsen shareholder welfare. So in, in some sense, so the fact that liquidity can be, can be bad, I, I see it as, as a, a, a very embraceable uh, normative implication because it also means that corporate governance beats asset pricing, which in this audience, hopefully we can all agree on. Um, so those are implications in some sense of the profession, but if you think about the real world, the, the implication uh, that, that really comes out of the paper is that shareholder de democracy can be worse for shareholder welfare because of this endogenous distinction with the marginal voting and marginal uh, uh, own, uh, and average ownership than a board that faithfully represents the average post-trade shareholder. Okay, this is what Nadia calls the, the optimal bias board. Um, I may raise a, a question about uh, whether we should be calling this uh, entirely biased, but in any case, that the board is the one that faithfully represents the average post-trade shareholder, this board can be better than, than shareholder democracy. I, th I think this is a very uh, deep and, and interesting point. And I'm not going to critique it, but I, I just want to think aloud a little bit in terms of what we understand about some aspects of the real world and um, uh, and this and this implication. So, to 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 how to what extent should we take this uh, implication at, at face value in some sense? So, let me. I, I'm just going to put up this one slide of, of comments, and then if there's later on time, I have some other comments that I can uh, that I can raise. Um, but, but, but here is, um, so, so essentially all of the paper's dynamics are driven by this intricate relationship between uh, voting preferences driving trade, which drives differences between marginal voters and, and average ownership. I want to ask sort of broadly sort of how much that actually holds in the real world. So, um, so for this, let's just imagine an activist proposal at a firm that's opposed by management as activist proposals often are. And let's just think about one key large quote unquote conservative voter um, who is a, a mutual fund family, for example, 
that manages the firm's employee pension plans. This, this is a, a group of voters that we know quite a lot about. They've been analyzed quite a lot in the literature. We also know quite a lot about their biases. Um, what do we know is that such families vote pro-management and contested shareholder proposals. Contested shareholder proposals are specifically the ones, as Nadia pointed out very, very nicely, where the median and the average, the median voter and the average owner uh, can, can be different in terms of their views. There is also anecdotal and indirect, I should emphasize indirect uh, large sample evidence because uh, there is no smoking gun on, on this stuff, which suggests a quid pro quo between company management and fund families that, that manage their pension plans, that the maintenance of these pension contracts, which is very lucrative for these fund families, 15% of their uh, uh, average uh, income, I think, according to some calibrations, is actually contingent on such voting support. So then, I think the question arises that when you're faced with an activist proposal as a conservative voter, do these conservative voters of this type, do they sell out as, as the, the, the tight link between um, uh, uh, you know, voting preferences and, and trading direction sort of uh, 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 implies in the paper, or do they actually stand and fight because there's actually something worse that's going to happen to them um, if, they, if they don't, in some sense. And again, there is some evidence uh, uh, in the empirical literature that, that, that these particular types of voters both overweight their ownership of the firm and also don't sell when things that they don't like are happening to the firm. So, so, so in some sense, Again, this is not a criticism of the paper, but just trying to think aloud. Um, I feel that bias is is quite a subtle issue in some sense, that, that voting bias can actually also affect the ability to trade. And I think that this is distinct from what you do with uh, with index funds, where, where just there's some set of people who just cannot trade. But here, in some sense, the people who may be most biased against the proposal may exactly be the people who cannot be compensated by the price mechanism for their trading decisions. And, and, and that is, is the broad question that I want to pose to you uh, uh, for, for comments later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amil. And Nadia, would you like to briefly comment or reply to this comment of Amil? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Emil, for, for this great discussion. Uh, so uh, I'd like to point out two things. Uh, first of all, in terms of the right here to, about the empirical evidence, we definitely see uh, swings in the shareholder base based on shareholders' preferences and then that affecting voting. So I mentioned the paper that shows how swings in the uh, shareholder base about m and proposals, right, uh, affects the subsequent voting outcomes. Uh, Miriam and her co-authors have a paper showing how the voter base adjusts, the shareholder base adjusts following uh, changes uh, in firms' policies anticipating future future outcomes. Uh, that said, I completely agree with you also, right, that certain shareholders, especially those that can have a large impact uh, on outcomes, may choose right not to just buy and sell, but may choose to exercise their voting power or even maybe acquire more voting power to implement their preferred policies. And we actually explore it in that follow-up paper that uh, I mentioned. So we study in that paper exactly the role of block holders and how their trading decisions may swing uh, the outcome in certain uh, directions and how much, for example, they are even willing to buy, to pay for additional uh, shares in order to uh, implement their policies. So, so I'm completely with you on that. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Uh, Robert, please. Thank you, Mike. And, and thank you, Nadia, uh, for the presentation. Uh, it's a very particular subject, and one that is very close to my heart. Um, uh, just a short intro, I'm a partner at Civin Capital, which is uh, one of the, la uh, the largest activist uh, funds in, in Europe. So this is, so partly of daily business uh, kind of for us um, votes uh, and, and, the, and changing uh, the company agenda there. Um, I think this is a very relevant subject in, in general uh, and also in the real world. I think most easily this can be seen actually in the M&A situation, which are typically contested. Um, I think the when I read the paper, I immediately thought about the most high profile, um, you know, takeover, hostile takeover situation there. And I think a particularly good example that highlights it maybe the relevance of this paper was maybe the um, Kraft Cadbury um, takeover. This was probably 10, 10, 11 years back. I mean, uh, Kraft, the US uh, conglomerate trying to 
um, by this uh, British jewel. At the beginning of the takeover uh, offer, it was a very hostile one. Um, in particular, in particular, UK long-only investors, they wanted to keep uh, the company in the UK, wanted to keep it independent. Uh, and in the beginning, only like, I don't know, 5% maybe of the shareholder base was uh, in, let's say, merger ARP funds or hedge funds in, at that time. After, I think, 100 days of a takeover battle between the two, the shareholder register has completely changed. I think then more than one third was in the hands of merger ARP funds. And ultimately, when it came to to vote, it, it, uh, the shareholders voted in favor, 72% at that time. So it really, this, this kind of shifted the balance, uh, the trading around this event towards actually in favor of happening a deal. Uh, not necessary. I mean, yes, it's probably even against the initial shareholders that were at the time uh, long only. So I think this is a very, um, very relevant topic. And there are some other examples. I think there was a similar case more recently, SoftBank and, and ARM technologies in, in, in the UK as well. Typically, that's where you see it the most um, in these kind of situations. More generally, when I would say the, um, all the other items that you typically vote on, let's say it may be compensation, may it be um, uh, corporate governance changes, board changes, they're typically less uh, contested. And I think there, I think, is an important uh, distinction because I think you highlight, Nadia, you highlight shared democracy versus what primacy, but what we have actually in practice, I think, is somewhat a mixture between the two. So typically, you would see that the board engages on many of the, let's say, non-critical uh, or not, uh, not as contested situation very openly with the different shareholders. So it's very typical today for a large corporate to have discussions with the top 20 shareholders on a yearly basis in terms of compensation, in terms of um, board composition, direction of the company, and thereby moderating actually these kind of views. Um, so I think in, in, in practice, you have, um, I mean, I understand this is a theoretical model in which highlights one extreme, but I think in practice, you have a more subtle uh, conversation the whole, the whole year, essentially, whereby actually the board's um, the main task is actually to find a common ground among its shareholder base and then move it forward. Um, so I think that's, that's first when I read the paper, I think um, in practice, this is more, it's not as black and white. Certainly, and in particular in these topics when it comes to compensation and, and uh, board compensation and more, more, more openly strategy. Um, but I think the most easiest one to see the, the, um, the patterns of, or in particular the self-fulfilling prophecy part that you, that you highlight is when it comes to these m &A situations. Okay, thank you. What about Nadia? Do you want to make yeah, a absolutely. comment? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for both giving these examples and, um, and highlighting this. Um, yes, that's a, that's a very good point. And I think this uh, engagement and the desire to right to also uh, appeal to sh uh, shareholders um, is very important, especially when the company has long term shareholders that the board expects to stay with the firm forever. And that's not forever, but for a long time. That actually relates to one of the questions that was asked in the Q&A. So maybe I can uh, respond to both of them at the same time. So the question was about the role of index funds. And indeed, right, the index funds being long term shareholders, they sort of alleviate right, this swings uh, in, the, in the shareholder base. So, but on the other hand, they still determine the firm's policies, both because they are voting and because as Robert pointed out, the board tries to uh, appeal to the shareholders and engage in conversations with them. So uh, in the paper, we actually examine the role of these index funds and because as I discussed, they don't trade. So they don't affect sometimes the marginal trader, but they do affect what policies the firm is taking through their votes or through the board engaging with them. Uh, we show some interesting implications uh, that index funds may have a positive effect on prices, but negative effect on welfare. So this difference between the, the decision making and the prices determined by marginal traders becomes quite important. So thank you. Thanks, Nadia. Denis, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yep. can. all right. Um, okay, so first of all, let me uh, let me uh, summarize very quickly the uh, the paper, just in a nutshell, so that uh, I can I can make a few comments uh, following up on that. Uh, I think it's it's been very clear from the the, the presentation and the uh, the discussions uh, after that. Um, shareholder democracy takes the uh, the view that you know you start from shareholder base, there's voting, and that impacts shareholder value. 
I would say voting in a generalized sense, it could be influence on management and so on. Um, now, this paper uh, makes a very simple and powerful point that says, well, in fact, the causality may go the other way around as well. It's the anticipation of the vote that determines the shareholder base and raises the question, the paper, given that the paper raises the question of you know, what's the impact on, on shareholder value, okay? Um, as I said, uh, very simple, very uh, powerful uh, remark. And the paper itself is very clear. It's, it's, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, framework to think about these issues. I wanted to raise just a few comments. I'm not sure how many of those I'll, I'll get uh, time to uh, go through. So I'll start with the, uh, the main ones. Um, the first one is about the, uh, let's say, shoulder base management by companies. So the, the, the logic of the paper, in fact, the timing of the model, if you want, is start from some initial shareholder base. Now, initial is not exactly, initial means at the time we discover the firm, it has some shareholders, but we don't know exactly whether it's literally initial uh, shareholders. I'll talk to that in a sec. And then, of course, there's trading, new shareholder base, and some vote. Now, I think the paper is very clear about uh, steps two, three, and four, but I want to talk a little bit about step one or step zero, if you want. Where does this uh, come from? So um, uh, generally, I thought maybe there's a bit more that can be said about this initial shareholder base and maybe about the way companies do or should or should not, I'm not sure manage their shareholder base. And we know that companies do engage in shareholder base management. They, you know, starting from the IPO, they allocate shares to certain investors and not to others or to a mix of investors. Um, their governance in the context of the model would affect which type of shareholders would join, would want to buy shares in the company in the first place. Uh, perhaps the, uh, the blocks of equity that some shareholders may retain at the time of the IPO or uh, you know, be they founders, VCs, parent companies, in the case of, uh, of, of uh, carve-outs. Um, and obviously, all the issues about dual class shares, non-voting shares, loyalty shares, all of those will affect, but I want to emphasize that all of those would affect which type of shareholders you will attract in the first place. And by the way, perhaps reduce the uh, multiplicity of equilibria that uh, may plague the, uh, this type of models. Okay, this is point number one. Point number two is more about, I wasn't sure exactly whether it's a point about uh, the private values or about short sales or welfare, but let me throw my ideas in the mix and then see what, what, uh, what happens. So first of all, the, uh, the paper, it's very important in the paper that different shareholders in the company have different private values for the shares, meaning two different shareholders may value their shares differently. The, uh, the, the paper mentions several uh, possibilities of you know, where this comes from. Perhaps it comes from you know, different tax brackets, differences in beliefs, maybe some others. Um, in my sense, these different natures of private values may very well have an impact on, on, uh, on what we think about the welfare implications of, uh, of, of, of trading. Let me take the... Uh, an example for this example, I need to add the possibility of short sales, which is, uh, which is, uh, which are not allowed in, in in the paper. So imagine there can be short selling. <clears throat> um, say I believe decision A is best, but I anticipate sorry A is best, but I anticipate that decision B is going to be taken. And anticipating this, I'm maybe more keen on selling my shares. Uh, but I'm still imagine I'm still worse off than if decision A was were taken. I realize that I'm selling shares at a price that uh, other shareholders will set, but uh, I would still be better off, let's say, with decision A. I imagine the differences come from taxes, then I'm worse off, full, full stop. But if the differences come from different beliefs, then I might very well actually benefit from uh, decision B being taken, because I think you know, this company this is a terrible decision. This company will crash. Let me short the shares of this company. This is just an example, uh, uh, but I think it raises the, the, the question of uh, what happens when you, when you allow for short sales and should these additional gains be taken into account? Let's say these differences come from different beliefs. Uh, 
should I take that into account? And by the way, should the uh, welfare of pure short sellers who you know, start with almost no shares, but still perhaps one share in the firm, uh, should they be taken into account in, in the welfare? So I wasn't very clear on uh, the welfare criterion in that, in that respect. Point number three, um, shareholders versus board, boards. Um, the paper runs a comparison between, I think it's, uh, I understand exactly how, what is the, the point of this uh, stark comparison you know, between shareholder voting and board decisions. Um, in the paper, well-chosen boards can be better for shareholder value than, than voting. But I think in a broader discussion of, of uh, shareholders versus boards, I think you would want to talk about the problems about boards that shareholder voting were supposed to fix in the first place, or at least alleviate in the first place to have a, a fair comparison. When I say fair, I don't care really about fairness here, but more like a, a, more, uh, a more complete comparison. Mm -hmm. And talking uh, in that point, I'm, uh, I'm uh, joining uh, forces with Robert. I think what may be equally important is to understand which type of decisions should be delegated to boards and which type of decisions should be put to a, to a vote. Uh, <clears throat> and I think perhaps including these, uh, these uh, board problems may, may help you in that uh, direction in this or future research. Do I have time for one more, Mike? Yes, sure, Tony. <laughs> okay, let me add one more. Um, I think this one was, uh, was essentially mentioned, but you know, trading is going to affect shareholder, the shareholder base provided there is trading. And we know that in practice, there's lots of shareholders who are either not willing or less willing or less able to trade than others. They could be large shareholders with you know, large stakes that if they wanted to liquidate, they would have a, you know, big liquidity problems. Index funds, uh, these were mentioned also uh, early on. Um, by the way, there's more and more work on empirical work on the, uh, the voting patterns of index funds. And it turns out they're not as passive as one might think in terms of uh, in terms of voting. Um, and so more, you know, taking a more theoretical uh, or more abstract uh, viewpoint, is there something you can say about, you know, more heter heterogeneous ability or willingness to trade and the correlation with preferences? I think this is important. So, you know, if I'm an index fund and I don't trade or trade less than I would otherwise, what are my preferences? You know, to, it's very becomes very important to know what my preferences are for uh, for the outcome. Okay, let me stop here, perhaps. Thank you, Denny and uh, Nadia. There's lots of questions, very, some very challenging, some perhaps slightly easier. So, so you can choose. <laughs> it's too it's too much to answer them all. So you pick the ones you like the best. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, so um, in terms of, uh, I think it's a very uh, interesting question, right, about the how um, share, uh, manage, the first point, right, the managers can uh, manage their shareholder base. It also relates right, to Robert's question earlier, I think, uh, and how they sometimes can prevent uh, outcomes uh, that uh, will be against uh, their desire that might ar uh, arise due to trading. And um, I think uh, the, the points that you, you mentioned, right, the corporate governance arrangement of the firm are perfect examples of how share managers indeed can manage the shareholder base because by um, entrenching themselves, by uh, not staggering the board, right, adopting dual class share structures and so forth, essentially they, um, it de determines in some sense which equilibrium we're in because that limits the power of uh, shareholders to affect anything even if they do trade. And I think it's very much aligned with how we think, for example, about dual class shares. When companies go public with a certain founder who has dual class shares, the shareholder base that adjusts, right, that the shareholders who buy the shares in the first place in the IPO are those who agree with this founder's mission, with the way where the founder is going to take the company in which strategic direction. So I think it's um, very close to how we also think about this uh, problem. Um, and, um, let me think, there were many points, yes. So um, maybe just one, one other thing. I, I also agree with you, right, that uh, the board primacy versus shareholder democracy is definitely a very multidimensional problem. And we're definitely not saying, right, the, the channel we emphasize is the only one. There are definitely very other important channels that have been pointed out. Just what we do want to point out is that when we take into account trading, the simple intuition, right, that the bias board is necessarily bad 
uh, is not um, uh, is no is no is no longer true. Uh, and we discussed uh, index funds. I think it's fascinating how uh, ownership uh, changes uh, are happening now, and how the presence of these non-trade investors who are not trading uh, affects uh, voting. And uh, hopefully, that'll be the subject of more of more research. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to all the panelists uh, and of course to Nadia for all the responses. Um, it was a great panel and great presentation. Um, if you have any Q&A uh, questions, you can submit them. And meanwhile, I'm gonna ask Nadia one question um, coming from an empiricist, okay? And some of these points were touched upon uh, by the panelists. Uh, my, my question is this, let's imagine you would be the regulator tomorrow morning and you could make any regulatory change that you would want, okay? What would you recommend to the regulator to change? So for example, some of the, uh, some of the practitioners here and panelists uh, talked about changing, you know, where, when the shareholders can make a decision versus the board. So that's one possibility. Would you make this recommendation only for liquid versus illiquid companies? Would you say maybe that index funds should not be able to vote or that their vote should count less? What, which of all of these or maybe other possibilities would you recommend? I know it's a hard question. I hope it's not a too tough one, but you know, maybe you can say something of, 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 of an, you know, practical recommendation given the theoretical analysis you have in the paper. Uh, that is a tough question. <laughs> so maybe yes, let's. I'm sorry, I was not too tough. <laughs> right to give policy, but um, one 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 thing you pointed out, right, and that relates again to many of the points we, that were brought uh, up before by Denis and uh, uh, Robert and the Q and A uh, questions about index funds. And I know there are proposals uh, by right. Uh, there are there are proposals, policy proposals out there, for example, to restrict. Uh, index funds mm -hmm. from voting. And in some sense, right, what our paper emphasizes, if we believe, right, these index funds are long-term shareholders who think about the long-term value and focus on value maximization, restricting them from voting could be detrimental because that could allow the remaining shareholders to really swing the voting outcome through their trading in the direction that may not be uh, mm -hmm. welfare, right, and fund value beneficial. So in that sense, uh, we in some sense emphasize, right, that this particular policy proposal may not be that, uh, that clear. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, so, um, Mike, I am passing yes. the virtual microphone to you. Yes, okay, I think we are actually, the hour is up, so I would like to thank Nadia and the panelists, and I thought it was very interesting, and it's, I mean, clear, as the last question showed, clear policy recommendations are very difficult, but I think well, we have learned today that right, increasing shareholder power is not uh, giving them more often the right to vote, does not necessarily mean they are better off, and it is in particular for the channel of the endogenous ownership structure, i.e. the trading for the share by the shareholders, as well as when, as Tony pointed out, the whole, the whole dimension that you may want to start managing as a firm, the shareholder base, which then gives rise to essentially complicates matters <laughs> considerably and makes it much harder to come up with sort of simple solutions to the, these questions of how much of venture that the shareholders actually have a vote. So thank you everybody for participating and have a good evening, night, wherever you are. Bye-bye.